Welcome to this step-by-step -step tutorial where we'll guide you through the otherwise tricky process of building an end-to-end -end image analysis web application. By leveraging the power of the OpenCV library, the gold standard in image analysis, and serverless cloud technologies, you'll soon master the art of lean, media-focused web applications. We'll take you through a comprehensive journey where we'll demonstrate the use of cloud functions for API backend image manipulation and updates. You'll learn how to harness the potential of cloud storage buckets for media and make them public for seamless front-end integration without any additional authentication code. While we'll showcase the base case of a public bucket, you can always opt for private media storage. You'll then master the art of simple but powerful cloud load balancing to connect the dots across your users, your APIs, and your web application front end. This tutorial caters to various skill levels, starting with the basics for those with simpler use cases and delving into advanced production aspects, such as implementing authentication structures for a public front end web application. The authentication layer will specifically leverage the power of Cloud Run and OAuth2 proxy, creating a protected yet serverless and easily deployable front end. Our front end application will utilize cloud storage directly, while our website front end and API will go through a Google Cloud load balancer for advanced HTTP routing and additional capabilities such as turnkey CDN or web services. Finally, we'll walk you through the Google Cloud as your OAuth2 provider, but remember that you can easily substitute your preferred provider, such as GitHub or Keycloak, and still follow along effortlessly. So let's dive in and start building your media analysis web application. With the goals now established, we'll start with Google Cloud Console and an IDE to set everything up. We have a new Google Cloud project, the Cloud Shell Terminal open from the top right corner and the editor launched in a new tab. The Cloud Shell IDE provides a convenient environment to build our application code and effortlessly authenticate with the Google Cloud Platform. First, we'll build the scaffolding for our repository, which includes both the front end and API components. We'll begin by examining the front end code, specifically the index.html file. This basic file starts with HTML and the head, where we'll provide a title and link to our styles. In the body, we'll include some additional information about the website and programmatically add a subtitle later. We need controls and a canvas for the images we'll be analyzing. At the bottom, we'll load the OpenCV library and our app.js code. The controls are necessary for our application's intended purpose as a change tracker for images, allowing us to delete the latest version of an image if needed. We'll utilize the version control built into Google Cloud Storage for this task, making it a relatively simple approach. The canvas container will hold the two images we plan to mark up and label with image differences. These images will be displayed side by side for easy comparison of changes in our media assets. Let's take a look at the styles.css file next. In this file, we have simple styling to add some flair to our front end without overcomplicating the code. We include elements like button colors and font sizes. For the canvas container in Canvas, we use a flex display to show both images side by side. Moving on to the app.js file, We'll build this out function by function, encapsulating all the code in an object called image comparator. First, we'll define some strings for the image comparator, which includes the bucket name, API endpoint, and API token. Since we haven't set up the API or buckets yet, these are placeholders, but they help us draft out our goals before we work on the backend details. Next, we'll create an initialization function that adds event listeners to the three buttons. These buttons will need properties from the image comparator component, so we'll add a bind to the functions executed when the buttons are clicked. We'll build out these functions shortly. The code will then fetch images from our media bucket using the latest two versions, or generations, for side-by-side -side comparisons. We'll also add a console.log 
for debugging purposes. To load images and some of our functions, we'll provide a utilities function that leverages a JavaScript promise. Since we're fetching images directly from Google Cloud Storage via the domain name for those assets, we'll need to set the cross-origin attribute to anonymous to pull images from a domain that isn't our website. We mentioned setting the subtitle based on JavaScript code earlier. This function will accomplish that by retrieving the image we're analyzing, obtaining its name, and setting the subtitle text content accordingly. Next, we need to add our image comparison function, which is the core of the application. This function will utilize the OpenCV library we mentioned earlier. We'll obtain the images from the media links, ensure they have the same dimensions, and analyze the differences between them using OpenCV. The analysis will identify changes and highlight them with green rectangles, making it easy to see the differences between the two image versions. Afterward, we'll display the images by rendering them to the canvases. Once that is done, we'll remove any unnecessary OpenCV variables. Finally, we'll set the subtitle in the HTML code using the file name. Next, let's examine how we obtain our images when the application initializes. We will use the Google Cloud Storage API directly because we need information about the generations. We'll use the bucket name we defined earlier. We will then attempt a JavaScript fetch to find and group the images by their names. This step is necessary because when we run the API call with versions equals true, it provides a list of images, including separate images for each version or generation. We want to group them by name and associate multiple versions of the same image. Following that, we need controls for our buttons. For the previous image button, we'll create a function that decrements the index of the image we're viewing. Similarly, we'll add a next image function that increments the index. Lastly, we need a control for deleting the latest version of an image. We will create a function that makes a POST call to our API endpoint, which we haven't yet created using an API token. Based on the bucket name and object name provided, our cloud function will delete the latest version of the image. All right, this looks great. We can use the web preview function in the Google Cloud Shell to view our website once we run a small development web server. Please note that since we haven't yet created our API or media bucket, we will encounter several console errors, such as 404s, when accessing the Google Cloud APIs. However, this is expected and normal at this stage. Let's proceed by completing the additional details. We'll start with our Google Cloud Storage bucket. We need to create one and can choose between two approaches for the bucket name, a domain name or a non-domain name. The difference lies in, for example, using analyze.notomatic.io or analyze-notomatic-io. If we want to access our assets over a custom domain without HTTP, the domain name approach can be beneficial. However, since we're only using the Google Cloud APIs right now, the bucket name isn't too significant, so we'll use analyze-notomatic-io. A multi-region US setup should suffice, and we'll select the Auto class, which automatically moves our objects' images to a lower cost storage model. This option is convenient when we don't know in advance how often we'll be accessing images. We're going to make this bucket public, so we need to uncheck public access prevention. Uniform access control is typically recommended as it provides the easiest way to control access to our bucket instead of managing access for each individual file. We also want object versioning, which is essential for our analysis since we'll be comparing versions and relying on Google Cloud to handle version tracking. With all settings defined, let's go ahead and create the bucket. Now that we have our bucket, we can start uploading some image files. Let's create a few images that we can later use to demonstrate how this will work. For instance, we can take a screenshot of the console. After making some changes like closing a window and running commands, we can take another screenshot. Additionally, let's capture an image of the monitoring page for more options. 
With the images ready, we can now upload them to the bucket by dragging them over from our other screen. Here's our first image. We can click into it and see the image. To use the version tracking feature, we need to ensure we use the same file name. So I'm going to rename the second screenshot to match the first one and move it over. We should get a prompt about overwriting the file, but since we have versioning, this is exactly what we want. We'll do the same with our second image. Now, if we go into either of these screenshots, we'll be able to see that there's a version history. We have two different images here, as far as the generations are concerned. We do have some controls for potentially restoring old versions, but we primarily want to use these in our application. To test this in our application, we need to set the permission so that this is a public bucket. We'll click Grant Access, and for all users on this particular bucket, we're going to allow object viewer permissions. We'll receive a warning that this means public access, but that's okay. We just want to ensure that we don't grant read access beyond this bucket and that we don't provide any admin or write permissions publicly. Now, if we go back to our application and open up the console to check for any errors, we don't see any, indicating that our application is working. We can see the changes highlighted by the green boxes. These are fine grained details with a thick rectangle box highlighting the changes. When we look at the next image, we see that a lot has changed, including the addition of a new web preview tooltip in the second image. With our application's foundation in place, we'll now add some additional features. First, we're currently accessing this locally through our Cloud Shell IDE. We need to deploy it as a web app. Second, we'll implement associated security measures. Finally, we'll set up an API so the delete latest functionality works. Currently, if we inspect the element and go to the console, pressing the button will result in errors since we haven't set up the API yet. Let's start setting up those resources by going back to our IDE and setting up the API. We'll use Cloud Functions for this, which offers a simple approach. We just need some basic Python code, really just a couple dozen lines. We have an entry point called delete underscore GCS underscore object, which will delete the latest version of our object. We'll include a couple of checks at the beginning for an API token and to ensure that the request method is valid. Next, we'll get the bucket name and the object name from the JSON body of the request. If those aren't provided, we'll return a 400 error. From that data, we'll attempt to delete the object using the Google Cloud Storage client. If successful, we'll return a 200 status code. If not, we'll return a 500 status code. This is primarily done using standard Python libraries such as JSON and OS, but we do need to add the Google Cloud Storage package so that our function can use it. Let's create a requirements.txt file and add that requirement. Now, let's deploy this function. We'll create the function, which could involve enabling some APIs if prompted. We're going to run on the second generation and name it delete latest image version. We need to make our invocation accessible publicly. After giving the necessary permissions to our demo user account, we can enable the option to allow unauthenticated invocations for our function. Our cloud function needs a couple of environment variables. In our code, we check for the API token. Let's add that here and ensure it matches our front end code. We'll use Python 3.10 for the runtime environment and copy in our code from earlier. We need to change the entry point and specify the requirements.txt file. Once that's set, let's go ahead and deploy. 
With the function deployed, we could use the endpoint it provides, but we'll actually run into issues with CORS. To demonstrate what would happen, we'll update the endpoint in our app.js file and see the result in the front end. When we try to delete latest, we encounter a 401 error code because of an access control check. We're attempting a pre-flight CORS check, but it's unsuccessful. We could set up response headers in our cloud function to allow cross-origin requests, but that would complicate our code. Instead, let's take the other approach and run both our API and front end on the same domain using cloud load balancing. We'll modify the code and deploy it to Cloud Run, serving both our API and front end from a cloud load balancer. As we're making this an internet accessible application, rather than something running in a controlled IDE environment, we also need to consider authentication and authorization. When bundling this up in a Docker container, we'll use the OAuth2 proxy project, which requires users to authenticate when accessing the application. Here, we're specifying that our app will run on port 8080 and serve the files in our static website directory which we'll copy later into our Docker image. Later, we'll use environment variables to specify the OAuth2 details. To make OAuth2 work, we need to set up OAuth credentials. We'll do this in Google Cloud, but remember that you can also use another OAuth2 provider. We'll create an OAuth client ID and first configure a consent screen. For our case, we'll use an internal consent screen and our domain for the organization. We'll leave most fields blank as we don't need any scopes at this point. Next, we'll create OAuth client ID credentials for our web application, adding the location from where we'll be serving our application and the callback URL. We'll need our client ID and client secret. So let's save those in a new text file for now. Then we'll deploy the app. In our front end directory, we'll run a cloud run deployment command. This command has multiple parts, so we should be cautious. First, we specify the email domains for valid access. We also provide a 16-character random string for the cookie secret to persist valid authentications in cookies. Additionally, we need to provide the client secret and client ID we just generated. We'll define the source, and the deployment process will use the Docker file in our directory to build and deploy the application. Once we deploy, we'll be asked to enable more APIs, but then our service will be successfully deployed. With our Cloud Run service now deployed, let's check things out in the console and then set up our load balancer, which will be our last step. We have both our front end and API running in Cloud Run. We see both since the Cloud Functions version 2 is actually backed by Cloud Run. Everything looks great. So let's set up our load balancer to enable access across these two services. We'll be using HTTPS load balancing and Google Managed Certificates, which means we need a static IP. We do want an HTTP to HTTPS redirect, and this will be our only front end. We can serve everything from here. In our back ends, we need a couple. The first one will be our delete function, which will come from a serverless network endpoint group. We'll turn off Cloud CDN since we don't want caching for our application. 
Next, we'll create a separate service for our front end. Again, make sure to keep Cloud CDN off to simplify things. With both backends now defined, we just need to configure the routing. Specifically, we'll route everything to our front end unless it's on API v1, which will be our API endpoint that accesses our image version deletion API. We can review and finalize here, and everything looks good. Next, we'll need to set up a DNS record to point our domain to this new load balancer IP. We can find the provisioned IP on the IP page. Afterward, we'll quickly switch projects to where the DNS is set up and create an A record pointing to the load balancer. Now, back in our load balancing, we need to give it a few minutes, not only for the load balancer to provision, but also for the SSL certificate to provision, which could take around five to 10 minutes. Once the certificate is active, we'll be ready to test out the setup. Finally, navigate to the domain to see the result. We can see that our website is protected by the authentication layer. Let's test if our API setup was successful by calling the delete latest function. To validate that it went through successfully, let's look at this from the back end. In our bucket, we'll choose the corresponding image and examine the version history. After running delete latest, we can see a successful call in the network tab, along with the response indicating that our latest image was deleted. Let's verify that in the Cloud Console with a refresh. Indeed, we have deleted the latest version. With this demonstration, we hope that you now have a basic understanding of how to set up an image analysis web application using OpenCV, front-end code, Cloud Run, API Code, Cloud Functions, Google Cloud Storage, and OAuth2 Proxy. We'll be monitoring the comment section for any questions and would like to thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.